Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Glasgow Science Centre. I'm delighted to be your host for this evening. My name is Heather Reid. I'm a retired weather forecaster and meteorologist, so obviously very interested in this evening's hot topic. But more importantly, I'm also very proud to be a trustee and a board member here at Glasgow Science Centre. I'd also like to welcome and thank our supporting partner organisations this evening, namely Scottish Power and the Association of Science and Discovery Centres. Thank you very much for your support. Now this science centre, as many of you will know, has been open for over 12 years now. And our purpose is to help people discover and enjoy science but it's also to help people understand its relevance to their own lives and to appreciate the importance of science to well-being, prosperity and to society. Now we do this in a variety of ways, including a very successful schools programme where over 82,000 pupils visited the centre last year from across Scotland. Our outreach activities also engage a further 90,000 people through school and community groups. This is all on top of the 260,000 public visitors who came through the doors to the Science Mall last year. So with those big numbers comes big responsibility. And last year, as many of you know, we launched a new exhibition on the third floor called Body Works, which many of you will have visited. And this exhibition really demonstrated our commitment in partnership with the Wellcome Trust and GlaxoSmithKline to raise awareness about the science of health and well-being, medicine, lifestyle choices, and the sorts of technology involved in medical sciences. So given Glasgow's and the west of Scotland's, to be honest, poor health record, we decided that this was a vitally important area where we could have real impact and make a difference. And now, one year on, we're beginning to analyse all that, all that data that we've gathered from Body Works and see very positive evidence about the role this exhibition is playing within science education and society. So our next major focus here at Glasgow Science Centre is going to be energy and climate change and the future. We have a planned exhibition for the second floor here in the centre entitled Powering the Future. And we are very fortunate that the city of Glasgow is a centre of excellence for energy and renewables research and also industry engagement with many, many of the big industrial players in this landscape centred in Glasgow in the west of Scotland. Meanwhile, Glasgow City Council leads a, a first-of-its-kind city-wide sustainable Glasgow initiative with carbon targets within a specific time period. So our, in, our universities are internationally leading in areas such as wind energy, offshore renewable energy, systems infrastructure, solar fuels, sensor systems. And the industry base is very strong and early discussions and indeed funding commitments have been very, very promising. And we're, we, we're glad that the industry base and the universities are really, really committed to our public engagement agenda. So we look forward to working with all of our partners in university and industry as this exciting new development takes shape over the next six to 12 months. And on that theme, who better to inspire us about this hugely important topic than the UK Government Chief Scientific Advisor, Sir Mark Walport. Sir Mark is a medical scientist specialising in immunology and rheumatology and a former head of the medical division at Imperial College London. He left Imperial to become director of the Wellcome Trust for a 10-year period before becoming Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Government last year. This event is actually part of a UK tour by Sir Mark as he raises awareness about climate change and reminds all of us that the planet really is in our hands. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm Glasgow welcome for Sir Mark Walcott. Well, thank you very much indeed, and it's a pleasure to be here. So my job as the Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Government is to advise the government on all aspects of science, engineering, technology, and social science with respect to all aspects of government policy. 
So it's sort of narrowly constrained. <laughs> and you might say, well, what am I doing here talking on this particular topic? Well, what are the things that government really does care about and indeed should care about? Firstly, it's about the health, the well-being, the resilience, and the security of its population. And the second thing, and the two are intertwined, is the economy. Now, thinking about what is it that determines our health, our well-being, our resilience, and our security? And it's our infrastructure. And it's that infrastructure that we take completely for granted until it goes wrong. <clears throat> so, in advanced societies, energy is an incredibly important infrastructure, our power. If the power goes off in this building, then effectively it's completely paralysed. And as modern advanced societies have become more and more dependent on that constant delivery of power, it means that our resilience has actually gone down when the power fails. And so, for example, as our society has become more efficient, those shops that we see, which are bringing with food, for example, rely on just-in-time supply lines. And if those just-in-time supply lines are broken for some reason, then we suddenly find the supermarket shelves are empty in a very short period of time. So our resilience depends on the fact that we have constant supplies of power. And you can look at our infrastructure in terms of our human-built, engineered, technological infrastructure. And then you can also look at it in terms of our natural infrastructure. And our natural infrastructure, it is our health, it's the health of animals, it's the health of plants, it's biodiversity, and of course, it's the physical environment, so our weather and our climate. And so it's immediately obvious that two of the most important infrastructures come together in this talk, which is on the one hand, our weather and our climate, and the effect that human beings are having on that, and then on the other hand, the cause of that anthropogenic, that human-induced change in our climate, which comes from the fact that we have become so dependent on the burning of fossil fuel in order to provide that power for our everyday life. And we shouldn't for a second mistake the fact that the fact that we have such a high quality of life is because of that industrial revolution invented in the United Kingdom which led to the transformation of so many lives, it means that we live longer, we live more comfortably. And so this is a very, very challenging issue. Now, I think there are three basic challenges related to climate change. So the first is actually understanding the science itself. And that's hard. The second challenge is communicating it and communicating it clearly. And actually, this slide um, is an example, and if you imagine the second slide blown up to full screen, is a very good example of how not to communicate science. And actually, scientists are often quite bad at communicating to each other, let alone to broader publics. And then the third challenge is the hardest challenge of all, and that's what we do about it, the policy challenge. And that's a challenge for all of us. Um, it's why I think it's so important to have a good discussion about the science, because scientists are qualified to do the scientific analysis, to try and explain and describe what's happening, to try and attribute cause. Um, but it's for all of us to decide what the policy implications are. And broadly, the policy implications are threefold. We could choose to do nothing <coughs> and just let change continue abated. We could choose to do absolutely everything at whatever price or we could choose something in the middle, and I'll come back to that. But that's a choice ultimately for all of us. And my job is actually to advise government on the science. It is actually for the politicians, the people we elect, to determine what are the policies. And that's why I think this is a very important discussion. And you might well ask, uh, what is a doctor um, doing talking about all of this? Because this is not stuff that you learn at medical school. Um, and indeed that's true. Um, but there's some things that you do learn at medical school which I think are extremely important for a chief scientific advisor. Uh, one of them, of course, is that science, that medicine is a very broad scientific subject. There's a lot of biology in there, a lot of human health, animal health. 
Um, and so there is a lot of science, and in fact, I had the good fortune through being 10 years as director of the Wellcome Trust that this is my biological science was brought in more and brought in engineering and the physical sciences. But medicine actually teaches you to communicate, and it teaches you something else as well, which is that on the one hand, the importance of using all of the best science in preventing, in treating disease, but it also teaches you that you sometimes have to make decisions in the, base, in the face of incomplete scientific evidence. And sometimes the, sort of, the scientist's response is to say, well, Minister, there's another 10 years of experiments before we can answer that question. That's not very helpful when a decision has to be taken in a week's time, a month's time, or a year's time. And so there is something about being a, recognizing that you have to use all of the science that is available, understanding it, but then making decisions based on incomplete science and uncertainty. And looking into the future, as I will tell you, there's a lot of uncertainty, and we have to recognize that. And I always say it's much easier to predict the past than the future. <laughs> so one of the big challenges in discussing and communicating issues about climate is the confusion that tends to occur between uh, what Heather was talking about, which is weather, and climate. And climate is essentially our weather averaged over long periods of time. And of course, we living in the UK have always had the privilege of a very variable weather. We can see four seasons in the matter of a day. Um, and so the weather fluctuates greatly, um, and there have always been extreme weather events. Um, climate is actually about averaging the weather over long periods of time. And there's no single definition, but we're talking about periods of 10 years, 30 years, 100 years, so long periods of time to reliably see changes. And there are, of course, a number of natural influences on our climate, and they all operate on different timescales. So the one that all of us are familiar with is the fact that our climate varies on a seasonal basis. So the distinction between spring, summer, autumn, and winter. So there are the annual cycles, the seasonal cycles. And then a lot of uh, the planet's weather is determined by <coughs> circulation of uh, the oceans and the seas and the currents um, and the winds that follow. And so we have cycles that vary over a matter of a few years, so multi-annual cycles, and uh, currents in the Pacific, El Nino and La Nina associated with changes in the trade winds, are examples of uh, influences our, on our climate which recur every few years. Then there are longer cycles, so there's something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and that causes, again, it's a, a overturning currents <coughs> and the oceans, bringing up cold uh, water from deep down, and that causes shifts in the climate every 20 to 30 years. And then there are solar cycles, because of course it's the sun that actually feeds energy into the planet. And we have the solar cycles, which are well understood, and they range from an 11-year cycle between the sunspot minima and the sunspot maxima, to very much longer cycles, which are called Milankovitch cycles, and they occur over about 100,000 years. Um, and they're seen most obviously in the Ice Age cycles. So those are changes in the Earth's orbital parameters. And so simply understanding all of this is very, very complicated. So climate science is complicated stuff. Now, what we're talking about in terms of the anthropogenic, the human effects, is due to our emission of greenhouse gases. And without the greenhouse effect, the planet Earth would be a very different place, and life as it would have evolved on it would have been very different, because without the greenhouse effect, and the physics of this was established in the 19th century, the Earth would be about 30 degrees centigrade cooler, uh, so very much cooler than the Earth we have. And the basic physics is that the sunlight comes in, and it comes in at short wavelengths, it comes through the atmosphere, it warms the Earth, and we all know when we stand in the sun, the warming effect of that solar radiation coming to the Earth. And then some of that is reflected back. Um, but what happens is, as the planet warms, as the surface warms, it in turn emits off uh, longer wavelengths, so infrared radiation. And again, most of that escapes to outer space, 
but some of it is trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And water is an example of a greenhouse gas. Uh, but what has changed is that we have changed the composition of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution, and that is changing the climate of the planet. And so here you see um, uh, graphically uh, carbon emissions, carbon dioxide, and you can see some of that reflecting back the infrared which is emitted from the surface. So that is the greenhouse effect. Now I think we often forget the fact that we have in fact inherited our atmosphere, the atmosphere with about 20% oxygen concentration, from our ancestors. Uh, they're not ancestors that we would readily recognize, but these are the early microorganisms that acquired the ability to photosynthesize. And what they did as part of photosynthesis, which is what modern plants do photosynthetically, is they take up carbon dioxide and they break that down and they release oxygen. And they fix that carbon and then when they die and they can become fossilized, that is our fossil fuel. And so photosynthesis, those organisms that created the modern atmosphere, began about two and a half billion years ago. Um, and then the Carboniferous forests emerged, they evolved, and again they fixed carbon dioxide on an absolutely gigantic scale. And then they died and they inherited, we inherited that energy. And what we're effectively doing is then burning that and releasing back the carbon that they fixed from the atmosphere all those billions of years ago back into the atmosphere. So we're reversing what happened in terms of the, uh, some of the biological factors that created the atmosphere <coughs> today. And so those fossil organisms have ended up as coal, as oil, and as natural gas. And what we're doing is harvesting that, setting fire to it, and in doing so, releasing carbon dioxide. And indeed, there are other greenhouse gases as well, such as methane. Now, we've also modified the environment in many other ways. And one of those ways is that we've actually caused tremendous deforestation, for example. So going back from 1000 BC to 1500 AD, it's estimated that um, England and Wales were deforested from about 90% tree cover to about under 20%, 17% tree cover. So humans have modified the planet in all sorts of ways. Um, and of course, the pace of that accelerated with the Industrial Revolution. And I would argue we should be conscious of our legacy. So if you look at this very compressed history of um, humankind, then from developing complex stone tools about 100,000 years ago, we then had the domestication of fruits, of plants, of animals. Uh, we had farming, uh, we had deforestation, and then the change really went up a step change when the steam engine was developed, which of course was powered by steam generated by heating water using burning fossil fuels. And of course what has happened is that that revolution has in itself allowed human populations to grow exponentially. And so you can see this explosion in human populations happening essentially since the Industrial Revolution such that we now have about 7 billion, 7,000 million humans living on planet Earth. And our atmosphere is now catching up. Um, the time scale is different here, so it goes back about 800,000 years. Um, and what we're measuring here is carbon dioxide concentrations. And you might say, how do we know what the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was 800,000 years ago? And the answer is that we have a record of our atmosphere because in the cores that can be taken of ice uh, from Antarctica there are little bubbles of atmosphere that are trapped and so we can measure them and we can roughly date um, when they date from. And the important thing about this slide is that if you look until the present the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years never got above about 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide. But what you can see, and over really a tiny time scale in terms of the geological history of the planet, uh, you can see that the carbon dioxide concentration has now gone up to about 400 parts per million, and that's an observed measured concentration in the atmosphere. And then what you see with the green spot and the yellow spot are two possible futures 
to 2100, where if we carry on with business as usual, it may be as much as 900 parts per million by 2100, or in a lower emission scenario, we might keep, manage to keep it down to about 550 or 60 parts per million. But these are future potential scenarios which we are able to influence. Now, my job is made easier by a technique that was essentially invented in my own field of medicine, which is called meta-analysis. And what meta-analysis is, it takes all of the scientific literature on a particular topic, and a group of expert scientists works through it all and arrives at a consensus opinion on what that science says. And I know very well from medicine that different results, different studies give slightly different results. And if you really want to know what drug X does in condition Y, then you have to look at all of the evidence. And in the UK, reviews were uh, invented. They were named after a famous physician called Archie Cochran, a public health doctor and physician. Um, and this is a probably the, the, the largest meta-analysis that has ever scientifically been conducted. It's conducted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they've reviewed literally thousands of papers, each of which was scientifically peer-reviewed by a number of peer reviewers, uh, 259 lead scientific authors from 39 countries. Um, and they put together a report. Um, and the first part of that, on the physical basis of climate change, came out in 2013, so last year in the autumn. Um, and again, you can start seeing on this the difference in the top between the fluctuations in weather on a year-to-year -year basis and then the climate as you average it out over long periods. And so what we're looking at here is measurements of the temperature at the surface of the Earth going back to about 1850. Um, and what you can see is that um, and the, 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 it, it's, um, the anomaly, as it's called, is relative to 1961 to 1990, so that's the zero point. So temperatures before that are less than that, and temperatures since are higher. And what we've actually seen is, since about 1900, on average, the surface temperature near the surface of the planet has warmed by about 0.85 degrees centigrade. And you might say, well, that isn't very much. And that's one of the problems in communicating climate change, because it's the challenge of, on the one hand, what appear like small numbers, and on the other hand, the challenge of comprehending the very large numbers which are associated with our carbon and other emissions. And what you see on the bottom is the same data, but it's been averaged over 10-year periods. And each of the last three decades has been warmer than the decade that preceded it. And that 30-year period is warmer than anything across the whole of the planet that's been identified in any of the last 800 years. And so the evidence for warming is very, very strong indeed. Now, you might say, well, okay, is that all the evidence? But actually, it isn't by any means. It's just one of a series of measures. So there are a number of predictions that you would make in any environment that is warming. Firstly, you'd predict that the temperature would be warming in a number of different places. So it's not just air near the surface, so air in this room, as it were. It would be air at, air at, at higher altitudes. Um, you would expect that there would be warming of the sea surface. Um, you would expect that the ocean heat content would go up. You'd expect that the temperature would go up over sea as well as over land. Um, and associated with the fact that there's warming of the seas, you'd expect to see expansion, because that's what happens to water as it warms. But you'd also expect to see that there would be decreased snow cover over land. You would expect to see that ice in the glaciers would melt. Uh, you would expect that sea ice area would decrease. You would expect more water vapor. So there's a whole series of fairly obvious predictions that, in a sense, we could all make because we know the relationship between temperature and the behavior of um, objects and of water and of ice. And if you then look at the measured results of all of these, then you see that the results are entirely consistent with this. So if you look, for example, and in some cases the measurements go back a long way, and in other cases not very far. So if you look at ocean heat content, this is going down to 700 meters, then these are seven different data sets. The data goes back to uh, the 1950s, essentially. And you can see that in each of these data sets, there's warming, there's increase in the ocean heat content. Um, the sea level 
is rising, and that's from a combination of expansion of water as it warms, but also an increased volume of water as water runs off the land, as glaciers melt, as uh, less, as, as less snow cover. And again, the observations are extremely consistent, and this is data that goes back to uh, 1900 before these reached different measurement series, and the sea at the moment is rising by about 3 millimetres per year. Uh, it's risen by about 0.2 metres since 1900, uh, by about 20 centimetres. And the cryosphere, the coating of the planet with ice, is changing as well. And so the Arctic sea ice, which of course has an annual cycle, being at a minimum in summer and a maximum in winter, is changing. And so the sea ice minimum in the summer is ever less, but it does vary on a year-by-year -year basis. So in 2012, it was lower than it was in 2013, and that's exactly the sort of fluctuation that you expect. But nevertheless, the trend is a steady decline. Um, and again, both the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets are losing mass, and in fact, many gigatons of water are running off these. Now, people sometimes say, well, yes, but there's the uh, sea ice of, of um, the Antarctica, and that's increasing. Um, and that is absolutely true. Um, and the explanation for that, if you think about it, is that if you take a freezer and turn your freezer from minus 20 degrees centigrade to minus 18 degrees centigrade, then ice will still fall. And if there's more water vapor in the air, then more snow will fall there, and it will persist in a mighty, in, in, in a below freezing point. So just because there are bits where ice increases doesn't negate the fact that warming may be occurring. As a whole. Now, a lot of attention has been paid by some people who are skeptical about all of this science on the so called pause. You know, the idea that somehow it stopped. <coughs> now, in any complex system, and this is an incredibly complicated and chaotic <coughs> system, there are year by year fluctuations, and there can be periods when things do slow down. And if you look at the temperature record, well, you could draw circles and say there have been at least three periods uh, when global warming has stopped. Um, and some of them may be due to factors, for example, such as volcanic activity, though that doesn't account for the most recent one. Because actually, if you put lots of volcanic ash into the atmosphere, then that will reduce the amount of solar radiation that comes in to planet Earth, and that will result in a cooling effect. So there are all sorts of effects. But actually, there really hasn't been a pause in global warming, because this looks at the warming in all of the different compartments. And by far and away, the biggest compartment of the planet in which warming occurs are the seas and the oceans. And so what we're looking at here is the energy which is accumulating in units called zeta joules um, in the upper ocean, which is the, the light blue part, the deep ocean, which is the dark blue part, ice, land, and then the atmosphere. And what you can actually see is that the atmosphere itself is a very small component of the heating, and most of the uptake of energy is occurring in the seas. But what this really shows is, and this is now looking going back to 1980, that you can see that in, in the pace of this so-called pause, the heat content of the planet is going up extremely consistently. So really there is no pause. And the other point which I've talked about, which is this small number, what we're really seeing is climate disruption. It's not that there is a consistent change. It's not that the temperature goes up 0.9 degrees everywhere. In some parts of the world, it goes up much more. And so this is looking back between 1901 and 2012. Um, and you can see that there are parts of the planet, so across much of Asia, across some of Africa, South America, North America, where the warming has been more than about two degrees. Um, there's one tiny part of the planet in blue uh, near Greenland where actually there has been cooling. And if you ask, well, what are the white bits in the middle? There are some bits where there simply aren't enough observations to be sure of what the answer is. Um, but I don't think you have to be a sort of an advanced statistician to look at this map and see the consistent direction of change. And it is climate disruption. So what are we seeing? We're seeing the extremes being exaggerated. So we're seeing, for example, in those parts of the world that are dry, we're seeing more dryness. So droughts in 
the Mediterranean, in West Africa, in Central North America, in Northeast Australia. We're seeing in those parts of the world that are warm, we're seeing increased episodes of heat. So we're seeing on the whole more hot days and nights, we're seeing fewer cold days and nights. Um, we're seeing a stronger tropical cyclones in the North Atlantic. So what we're seeing is exaggeration of events. We're seeing more extreme events. And the question often arises, so uh, we've just seen the wettest three months in the south and southwest of England since records began. Um, more than half a metre of rain in some parts of the country in three months. Is that due to climate change? Now the answer is, it is very, very difficult to attribute any single weather event to changes in climate. Because what we're seeing overall is statistical trends. What one can say is it is consistent with the direction of travel that we will expect if climate change goes on in an unabated fashion. And so scientists have looked at different events, the Arctic sea ice minimum I've talked about, the Iberian drought, the USA heat wave, the Australian rainfall in the summer of 2012, and they're all essentially consistent. Now, one example, which is, there's a different explanation, is Storm Sandy, was the sort of storm that does hit um, the northeast of the United States from time to time. But as sea levels rise, and 20 centimetres is not a trivial rise, then the risks of inundation from a storm surge become much greater than they were before. And humans have a habit of liking to live near uh, the water, and so many of the human population live at low lying levels near um, the sea or near rivers. And that now takes us to looking to the future. And we can't be precisely certain about the timings of the future. So these are directions of change. They're based on extrapolation of data. They're based on modeling the climate. Um, and these are now several different futures, depending on whether we do an awful lot to reduce carbon emissions or carry on with business as usual. Um, and so the, the four bars on the right are different mitigation, or in the case of RCP 8.5, essentially no mitigation um, over the next um, uh, 80 years or so. Um, and as I'll tell you later, once carbon is in the atmosphere, it stays there for a very long time indeed. Um, and so what we might expect to see would be about another 0.3 metres of sea level rise in a strong mitigation strategy, so reducing our emissions a lot. And the sort of broad blue around that is uncertainty, essentially. It's, it, it, the prediction would be it would in, be within that broad range, and then you can see that the sea level rise predicted would be very much greater if we didn't mitigate our carbon emissions. Now, what are the potential impacts uh, the impacts are potentially very severe indeed. And as I've already said, climate change will act basically to increase water availability in the wetter parts of the world and decrease it in others. So dry regions of the world were expected to become drier and wet regions to become wetter. Uh, that has implications for food. And people have sometimes said, well, actually, this will be an advantage. A bit more carbon dioxide, which plants can take up and photosynthesize, and a bit more temperature is going to be good for our plants. And it is perfectly true that in some parts of the world, there may be a temporary benefit from climate change. But it will only be a temporary benefit, because at higher levels of temperature rise, the net effect will be negative. Um, the species of plants that we farm um, that we grow, are adapted for the environment that we live in at the moment. Um, and I'll say a bit more about ocean acidification, because this is another set of impacts um, that will be um, unhelpful as well, unhealthy. Um, in my own world of medicine, uh, some human diseases, important human diseases, are carried by insect vectors. And as the climate changes, so the distribution of those insect vectors may change, and that will change potentially the distribution of diseases. And that's not only human diseases, but it's also animal diseases and potentially plants as well. Um, and then there will be a risk of increased heat-related mortality. And again, people have pointed out, well, the risk in the UK of deaths from cold outweighs the deaths from heat. And that is true at the moment, um, but in a very different climate 
then heat waves could be very bad for populations and uh, we shouldn't consider people in other countries. And as I've said, we'll also see more damaging extremes. Coming to the seas and the oceans, um, as carbon dioxide is taken up by the oceans, and as I've shown you, that's where most of it goes, um, then that results in acidification um, and the hydrogen ion concentration of the surface of the seas is about 26% higher than it was before. And that ultimately has severe implications for organisms that develop calcific uh, exoskeleton shells, for example, and will damage calcification. So there are a lot of marine species that are at risk from the acidification of the oceans. So that's the science. Now, we essentially have three potential policy responses. And one can put them in terms of uh, the way John Holden talked about <coughs> it. We can mitigate, by that I mean we can reduce our carbon emissions, we can reduce our demand on energy, we can adapt, that's the temperature barrier, or we can suffer. And the truth is that we're going to have to do all three of those, and I think the challenge for us is to optimize the ratio between them. And this is the challenge, that it's the big number problem. It's the 10 gigatons of carbon, which translates into over 30 gigatons, if you measure it as carbon dioxide, that we're emitting into the atmosphere each year. And where is that coming from? It's coming from coal, it's coming from oil, and this, this graph shows the differences between them from gas, and indeed from industrial production, such as cement production. And you can see the very dramatic rise in carbon emissions in the latter half of the 20th century as the development gathered a pace around the world as populations developed and in so doing so consumed increasing energy. Now, it is the problem of the large number. What does, and, and in the IPCC report, it sometimes talked about 10 petagrams. Well, you know, which of us has got an idea what a petagram looks like? So a petagram is actually a gigaton, but what does a gigaton look like? Well, a gigaton is a billion tons, and we sort of know that a billion tons is a large number. Um, that's a thousand million tons. Um, so let's just take one of those uh, tons and put it in New York Street. Um, and that's what a metric ton of carbon dioxide looks like. And the figure on the lower right, and this is taken from uh, the website Carbon Visuals, shows the daily emissions, just one day's emissions, of carbon dioxide <coughs> in New York. And you could just about see the Empire State Building peak out at the top of that. And we're talking about 30,000, or more than 30,000 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. So that is a very, 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 very large amount, and very surprising if it wasn't going to cause changes at a planetary scale. And once it's up there, it's up there for a very long time. And the clearance of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is complicated, but about half of it <coughs> is likely to remain in the atmosphere for hundreds and thousands of years. So we can't simply say, okay, we haven't got all the technology we need now, let's just carry on as we are, because every year we're putting up, in fact, an increasing amount, it's growing by three or four percent per annum, that um, 10,000 million tons of carbon, dioxide, of carbon each year. And this is one of the figures from the IPCC report again, and it's trying to look into the future with different scenarios. So what we can see on the y-axis, the ordinate, is the temperature change relative <coughs> to 1861 to 1880. So essentially back to the start of the Industrial Revolution, because for the first 100 years or so of the Industrial Revolution, there wasn't that much carbon emitted quantitatively across the planet. Um, and you can see that the black part of the graph, and sorry, on the, the, the x-axis on the abscissa, then you can see the cumulative carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions from 1850, again expressed as gigatons of carbon. And you can see that by 2010, we'd emitted about 500 gigatons, that's half a trillion tons of carbon. And that was associated with that temperature change I told you of about 0.85 degrees centigrade. 
Now, the projections are, they are modeled and they are uncertain, but you can also see that they are an extrapolation as well. They're on the same trajectory. That if we carry on exactly the same rate, then by 2100, we'll have emitted about 2 trillion tons of carbon dioxide. And the projection, the, the modeling is that that will be associated with a temperature rise of about four and a half degrees centigrade with quite wide confidence limits. So down a bit less than three degrees or up as five degrees or more. Um, and then there are a series of other scenarios. And the yellow one is an intermediate one. That's 1,500 um, uh, gigatons. We've got a, a light blue one. And then the mitigation strategy that would keep us within a temperature warming on average of about 2 degrees centigrade would allow us about another 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide to be emitted between now and 2100. Now that's quite a challenge when you consider that we're emitting 10 gigatons a year at the moment and that's increasing by several percent each year. So that's the challenge. Now, Someone has updated this today, that's very clever. Um, so this is an app called Grid Carbon. And if you want to know what the source of our electricity supply, this is our electricity supply, the energy sources for that were today, then as of um, lunchtime today, <coughs> we were emitting, the total output in the last 24 hours being 40.9 gigawatts. For every kilowatt hour, 498 grams of carbon dioxide is emitted into the atmosphere. And the energy mix that gives us our electricity supply at lunchtime was 36.7% uh, coming from coal, 29.3% uh, coming from gas, um, about 14.8%, just about 15% coming from nuclear. And wind, I can tell you, has changed dramatically overnight. And of course, we know that it's a windy day, but wind today is 9.3%. And uh, Giles is with me. I think it was about 0.9% yesterday. 1.8%. Yeah, 1.8, sorry. So that's a dramatic change overnight. And of course, it, it emphasizes the point that wind is a highly variable um, energy source because it blows some of the times and not others. Um, and then um, hydroelectric contributes about 1.7%. Um, we get some of our energy through a, an interconnector from the continent, from Holland and from France. Um, but you can see that the, ma vast, the majority of our energy supply for electricity generation comes from fossil fuels. So we're starting from a position where the majority of our energy is fossil fuel. And how do we use all of it? Now this figure is now looking not only at electricity but on uh, petrol or diesel, so all our fuels. And firstly, about 87% of our energy is supplied by fossil fuels. Um, and that's used about 38% of it for transporting us around. About 31% is used in our homes. About 17.5% is used in, in the industry. Um, and about 18.5% is agriculture, services, and other uses. And if you then ask the question just for transport out of interest, how do we use it in transport? 48% is used moving us around in cars, 26% uh, moving goods vessels around, 24% flying around the world, um, and interestingly ships account for just 1% and rail 2%. And so they're both very energy efficient ways of traveling, of moving either large cargo or large numbers of people. Now, the UK government has taken this very seriously for a long time. And actually, we had the earliest legislation and the strongest legislation in the world. So the Climate Change Act of 2008 requires that we cut our carbon emissions by at least 80% by 2050 relative to 1990 levels and by at least 34% by 2020. Uh, this is done through carbon budgets, um, which are set over five-year budget periods. The first ones were already set in legislation up to 2027. And those are um, advised, the, the level of those budgets is advised the government by the Independent Committee on Climate Change, and that scrutinizes how it's delivered through annual progress reports to Parliament, and government has to publish its policies and proposals. And looking at the resilience side, assessing the risks, every five years there's a risk assessment for the UK of the current and the predicted impacts of climate change. 
and a new review is just setting out at the moment, chaired by Lord John Krebs. So that takes us to the final bit of the talk, which is the policy challenges for all of us. And the challenge is around energy because it's how we generate and <coughs> use energy that actually will determine how we're able to respond to the challenges set out by our legislation. And this is where science moves to policy. And policymakers have to look through a whole series of different lenses when they determine policy. And the three lenses that policymakers need to look at for energy is firstly security of supply, because we can't have the lights go out. The second lens is the sustainability lens, which I've just been talking about. And the third lens is the price, the affordability of energy. And any policy that's determined by one of those three alone is unlikely to give a sensible or practical answer in terms of energy policy. So that's the policy challenge for the policymakers, politicians. And if you ask all of us, the public, then that's the answer we give you too, which is, and this is work done by a group in Cardiff, led by Nick Pidgeon, um, where he asked people about these issues. And I, I, I like the insect lenses, fortunately. Most policy issues don't have quite as many lenses as the insect's eyes. Uh, but when you ask people, 74% of respondents in the study were very or fairly concerned about climate change, and a similar percentage believed the UK should reduce its use of fossil fuels. That's a jolly big majority. 83%, um, so just over four-fifths of respondents, were fairly or very concerned that in the next 10 to 20 years, electricity and gas will become unaffordable for them. And a similar percentage of the public have strong concerns about the UK becoming too dependent on energy from other countries. And so when you actually ask all of us, then we identify those three policy lenses through which policymakers have got to determine a, an energy policy. Now, what about technology and solutions and our behaviour? And so we have to think a bit in terms of demand side solutions, so actually reducing our energy consumption, our, our need for power, and there are some things that we can do uh, in the way we move around, so we can move around on bicycles or on foot. Um, we can switch to electric transport, but of course that's only a useful thing to do if the electricity supply is itself decarbonised. We can turn the thermostat down in our houses and we can use um, things like smart meters which will help us to manage our consumption and if they apply appropriate incentives, reduce the top level of demand because of course the electricity supply has to deal with peak demands and so if we could reduce those peaks then we would, need, we would be able to reduce our overall generating capacity. And then there are solutions on the supply side of energy as well. Um, so there are solutions that uh, mean that from, from uh, sources of energy that don't release carbon into the atmosphere, so for example solar energy, uh, wind energy, um, nuclear energy, and then the other thing that we can potentially do is capture some of that carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels and if we can, uh, as it were, reverse the fossilization process or recreate the fossilization process by capturing that carbon and burying it deep underground, then potentially we can carry on using fossil fuel as long as we catch the carbon emissions. Um, and public debate about this, I think, is very important, and that's what tonight is about. Um, there's a very good uh, public engagement tool, it's a modelling tool developed by my colleague, the Chief Scientist of the Department of Energy and Climate Change, David Mackay, who's the Regis Professor of Engineering in Cambridge, and he's developed the so-called 2050 calculator, and that enables anyone to fiddle around with what is essentially an, uh, 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 an interface that allows you to model what you would need to do in order to achieve the UK 2050 targets. And indeed, this has uh, attracted a lot of interest across the world. And if you would prefer to do this in Mandarin, then there is a Chinese version hosted on Chinese websites um, and in Mandarin. And it's been translated for a number of countries and it's uh, being pulled. This is a very popular app, and there's now a global 2050 calculator being developed as well. 
So the technological challenge here is huge because I probably wouldn't be standing here giving you this talk if we had energy sources that were not um, uh, burning carbon and emitting it into the atmosphere, which were as cheap or cheaper than the burning of fossil fuels, and we don't have those. Um, and so we require an enormous amount of technological development and to use human ingenuity in order to develop the approaches that will reduce our carbon emissions. And humans have got together on major projects in the past. Um, so the Manhattan Project and the Apollo Project, and I don't have to tell you which of those I prefer. Um, but this is a case where humans, scientists, engineers, technologists, social scientists across the globe need to collaborate in order to work out what are the best solutions going forward. Um, the distinction between an Apollo and Manhattan project is that there is not a single magic bullet. There are going to be all sorts of interventions. There isn't any single technology that would answer all of the world's needs. We need to basically place our bets on a number of different technologies. And there are plenty of opportunities. The UK is good at technology, at engineering, at science, and so we can develop the innovations. We need innovations in our technology. We need innovations in the system for distributing our electricity. At this stage, as I've said, full-scale carbon capture and storage is not proven. There are two important demonstrator projects that are set potentially to go in the UK. Um, if you combine bioenergy sources with carbon capture and storage, you could actually potentially reduce net emissions. Um, nuclear energy, again, there are technological opportunities to make that even more effective than it is at the moment. So there's great opportunities. And as I've already said, many of the changes in our <coughs> behaviour will actually be good for our health and our environment, and potentially save money as well. Uh, but I've talked for the last few minutes about mitigation, but we also need to adapt. Um, and that's why the climate change risk assessments are important. Um, and we've seen the Thames Barrier, for example, working very hard for the last three months. And are there things we can do? Yes, of course there are. We can uh, use modern devices that are more energy efficient. We can uh, change our electricity sources. We can, very importantly, insulate our houses. Um, we can uh, change our heat sources potentially. There are a lot of things we can do. We can turn the thermostat down. You could say, well, individually, do they make much difference? Well, not to uh, over 30 gigatons of carbon dioxide, uh, but a lot of small changes start making a big change, and they send a message. Now, a lot of the debate has been about exactly when the Earth will become a very difficult place for many humans to live on. And economists sometimes talk about this in terms of discount rates, how much is our discount rate for the future? And that's quite a difficult concept, I think, to get one's head around. But another way of thinking about this is to think about future generations of humans because the carbon emissions we put up now are going to particularly affect future generations. And to me, the argument isn't actually about whether it's 2050, 2080, 2010 or 2050 because in the grand scale of even human existence on this earth, that is a very, very short time scale indeed. And I think the other way of looking at it is to say, what price a grandchild? How much will we invest for our grandchildren? And then, <coughs> more importantly, how much will we invest for our grandchildren's grandchildren? And I think most people who have grandchildren or can you know, visualize them coming would say that our discount rate for a grandchild is likely to be very low indeed. We know them, we care for them. The question I think for humans is what do we think about our grandchildren's grandchildren or their grandchildren? Because those are when the worst are going to be felt, and I haven't deliberately talked about all the sort of awful tipping points, the melting of the Greenland ice cap, the release of huge amounts of methane from permafrost. There are various tipping points, and we're very uncertain as to when those might occur. But if we carry on our present trajectory, then the planet will be a very different place for humans. And ultimately, it's not the planet that will suffer, and there will be other organisms that will survive. You know, the world will be dominated by the cockroach or the bacteria. Um, but it will be a very different place for our future. So the question, I think, is what price a grandchild? Thank you for your attention.
which should be on. Well, thank you very much indeed for that um, very detailed and, and concise um, overview and discussion of so many of the uh, the issues around climate change and the, the impacts, and indeed uh, bringing us into the whole policy area as well, which, which is so interesting. And we now have some time for uh, questions from the audience. So. Uh, would anyone like to kick us off? Yep, there's somebody just sitting near the front here who'd, uh, now I think we do have a microphone. So the acoustics in this lecture theatre are quite good, but there's a, a microphone for you. And if you could just give us your name and then a question, thank you. Thank you, it's John Cape. I, I suspect tonight you've been largely, as it were, preaching to the converted. How, how do you think we best share these messages with the as yet unconverted? <laughs> um, well, we live in a plural society, and frankly there will be some people who are never converted. Um, but I'm afraid the only way, I think, is by clear communication. It is by very careful analysis of the evidence. I think processes such as the IPCC one are very good indeed. Um, and I think it's partly about people like me communicating, but I think it's very important also that the deep experts communicate and communicate effectively as well. So I think it's got to be about talking about it. And I, I'm not sure there is any other magic bullet. Will we persuade everyone? No, of course not. Um, uh, but we live in a plural society, and that's what democracies are all about, actually. And there's another question at the back there. Thanks very much. Patrick Harvey. I'm a Green Party MSP for Glasgow. Uh, a, a comment and a question. First of all, I was just a wee bit surprised that you didn't recognise some of the, the differences between the Scottish and, and UK context in your, your presentation. We have, uh, you know, not uh, between 1 and 10% and of renewables, we've got something like a third of our electricity coming from renewables and we also have higher uh, climate change targets, although we're currently failing to meet them. And that comes onto the question, even if every environment minister in the world, and goodness knows the UK government has you know, a, a problem with this one, was fully committed to the climate change agenda. It's economic ministers, it's finance ministers that we need uh, to be the leading edge of this. And the, whether in Scotland or the UK, our, our governments are failing on, on that level. I wonder if you could reflect on the Environmental Audit Committee's report the other week about the carbon bubble, the idea that uh, our whole economy is going to be fundamentally compromised yeah. if, as you say in your, your presentation, 500 gigatons is the amount we can emit globally and something like 3,000 gigatons is the fossil fuel reserves that, that we have at the moment. We're, we're basing our economy on a profoundly overvalued commodity. How does, how does this economic agenda uh, start to, to get purchase on, on policy making? Well, I mean, on your first question, I'm the chief scientific advisor to the UK government, and I'm in the UK. Um, and, and, and the second point is that we do actually share the same atmosphere, so we are in this together. Um, on your second point, where I think you rightly identify a huge challenge, um, it is the policy challenge that I outlined, which is there are the three lenses. There's the economic lens, there is the sustainability lens, and there is the security lens. And that's why I'm glad I'm the chief scientist, because I think being a policymaker is very much harder. And you, as an elected representative, are one of the people who is in the world of making the policy. Um, and you're absolutely right. It is a very, very, very difficult economic challenge. But that has to be balanced against what is a huge environmental challenge. Okay, thank you for the, the question. And um, there's another one down at the front here. Just give us a wee second to get the, the microphone to you. Uh, Rick Starber from the RSA Wellbeing Network based in this city. There is another issue that's just emerged. Some of us have been campaigning, sorry, campaigning that the river is a risk and a threat. We're only about two metres above it sitting here at the bottom. But coming into our city now is another big environmental risk that relates to this. I discovered only yesterday that I'm one of the 1,200 Scots at risk of dying because I had childhood asthma and I am now suffering hypersensitivity to air pollution, which is directly related to the burning of the fossil fuels and the carbon emissions. 
So this isn't just a problem for my children, who are also sufferers, and my grandchildren, hopefully. It's a problem for a lot of us now. Uh, you're absolutely right. But I mean, the point is that, if you like, burning fossil fuels releases a series of different um, uh, products. Um, and of course, we've cleaned up a lot of those additional products. So uh, the burning of fossil fuel here is somewhat cleaner to the environment than, for example, it is in parts of China at the moment, where they have severe problems with smogs, for example, in Beijing. And that's very bad for people's health and in many parts of the world where they burn <coughs> fuel in an open environment, then one of the terrible health problems is respiratory disease, and people die early because of respiratory disease. And people talk about co-mitigation, where you can not only help climate, but also improve health. And one of the things that's really important is actually burning fuel in efficient stoves. And so burning fuels in efficient stoves in countries like India and in parts of Africa is undoubtedly both good for health because it reduces the extreme exposure to the different pollutants that come off when you burn fossil fuels and is because it's burnt more efficient, good for the climate as well. So, yeah, I mean, there are all these other issues as well. Okay, thank you for that point. And um, we have another question at the back there. I'll take that one and then along to the, the back. There's another one at the back, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Bartos, I'm a city councillor. Um, <coughs> interesting, my background is as a doctor, and so my question is going to have a, a connection there. My specialism was psychiatry, and I'm interested, as an elected uh, politician, about any evidence base which you might have come across which relates to um, the, the things which make people afraid of or make people able to make new decisions to change. Because uh, it strikes me that one of the things which we um, struggle with is that um, almost like facing a patient who has a severe malady, uh, there's a process of, uh, of sort of psychological denial even if there's a rational acceptance. I'm wondering what guidance you might be able to give to the policymakers <laughs> about uh, how to persuade uh, people to take perhaps less palatable medicine uh, uh, and if there's any evidence base for it. Okay, well, I, there's several questions bound up in that, and the medical models take you so far. Um, I think the first thing I'd say is that behaviour change is, of course, one of the things that's needed. And as you and I both know from our time in medicine, um, it's easy to say behaviour change and it's hard to achieve it. So we, in the context of obesity, we say, well, people must eat less, but actually that's not easy to do. And so beating people up about changing behaviour is very difficult. And we know the things that really make a difference are quite powerful incentives. So financial incentives, tax incentives, and indeed legislation, and those are the things that changed our smoking and uh, wearing of seatbelts, for example. And a lot of those actually are intergenerational as well. It takes new generations to grow up with different habits. Um, so behavior change is very difficult. Um, and I think that's really what it's all about. I do sometimes wonder whether some of the skepticism, however, isn't of the sort that you were just talking about, of people who don't quite like the implications of the science and think that the easiest way to avoid discussion of the policy options is to pretend that the science is wrong. And I've argued very strongly that I don't think that's a sensible way forward. I think we need to agree on the basis of the science, agree also that there are significant uncertainties as we go forward, but have the grown-up debate about the policy implications. And as your colleague sitting next to you said, these are jolly difficult, and that's why you, you're elected, I'm not. Well, thank you for that, that question, very thought-provoking question. And I think there's one in the back still. Someone have their hand up? Yep. Hi there, um, my name's Alison McLaughlin, um, and I work for the Workers' Educational Association. Um, so I've got a, a question about education. Um, we're a, a national voluntary provider of adult education targeting hard to reach disadvantaged learners and over the past 10 years we've developed and delivered numeracy in and environment courses here at the Science Centre in partnership with the community engagement team. From our experience a lack of awareness and understanding of the relevance of climate change to adults lives means they can be disengaged and lack the knowledge and confidence to take action which kind of links to the three 
uh, challenges that you, you mentioned earlier on um, about the science communication policy. And if people don't understand, they can't communicate or they don't have the confidence to communicate and therefore can't take action on policy that's going to impact in their lives. So um, from reading your, your recent article, um, Climate Change, No Excuse for Inaction, about climate change and the recent extreme weather, I, I wanted to ask your opinion on the importance of environmental and science education opportunities for disadvantaged adults who have become disengaged from learning and often from the communities that live, that they live in. I, I mean, I think the answer to that is very straightforward. We need to engage with all communities, and actually it starts with early education, um, and it goes, you know, no one should be denied the opportunity of education. But I think you raise actually a much more general issue, which is the issue of how we engage people in the sort of democratic process and in policy issues in general. And I think one of the feelings that people will have about this is that there is no impact that they as individuals can have. Um, and that's why I think it is very important that we actually encourage people to take part in all of the debates that we face at the moment. And this is one of the most pressing. And obviously my job is advice on science engineering technology. So it's very important in a, in a sense that's why I'm out and about talking about this. Um, and I think it's important that I talk on scientific issues in general. Uh, my primary job is to provide advice within government and this is an area where I had the chance to talk to the UK cabinet on the IPCC report which I did shortly after it came out. Uh, but we must all engage in the discussion. Okay, thank you for that question. And um, we have another couple of questions down at the front. So I'll, I'll take your question and then I'll come into the middle. Okay, so on the outside here. A few years back, I landed in California to see my brother on the day that the midterm elections for the Obama's first regime, yeah. the first government, uh, took place. When the, there was a huge swing against doing anything about the environment. At that time, the scientists in America actually got up and said, we've actually got to tackle these people head on. And if it means going on to a radio station and being screamed at by some shock jock, we've got to put up with it. Next Tuesday, we start the first planning inquiry into the commercial extraction of coal bed methane near Falkirk. Uh, I've been working on it now for the best part of two years. We've had a great deal of trouble really getting scientists to actually come out and actually put something in paper themselves, on paper themselves, about this scheme. We've got a few that have come forward now. It's very much relied on people like me sitting down and reading scientific journals and then trying to paraphrase it for the planners. The real question is, when can we see some of the scientists that have got the knowledge come out of their ivory towers and actually join us in the muddy, mess of the world. Well, I always encourage scientists to communicate, but I, mean, I would make a specific communication about methane, and that is that if you have a choice of burning coal or burning methane efficiently, then methane burnt well is releases less carbon into the atmosphere than coal does. So on a track to reducing our carbon emissions, then natural gas is actually better than coal. It is still a fossil fuel, as my colleague David Mackay has pointed out, but um, we're not going to win ourselves a fossil fuel overnight, and we ought to be burning the best fossil fuel that we possibly can. And in that context, actually, natural gas is better than coal. Okay, thank you for that question and the points you made. And uh, we'll take the mic into the middle now. Uh, Martin Mathers. Um, recently, at a parliamentary select committee, you we're asked about Matt Ridley's assertion that uh, climate change was good for this country and we should therefore not be worried about it. Um, and my question is, in the unlikely event that we had a cabinet minister who expressed a similar view, I know that would never happen, um, how, how would you deal with it? Um, I think you need to distinguish between the individual views of people and the view of government as a whole. And so I'm absolutely clear that the UK government policy is understands the science of climate change and that the policy is very clear. Within any group of people there are people with very <coughs> different views, but they shouldn't necessarily be equated with the views of a government. That's the point. Okay, thank you for that one. 
and um, will we go to the lady first and then there's a question towards the back, okay? Hello, um, Eve Hubex. Um, I'd like to ask about the, your three um, competing or lazy yeah. little yeah, lenses, yeah. and to what extent does uh, do international pressures drive the economic lens in advance of the other two? Well, I mean, of course they do, because um, uh, we live in a world where countries are competing economically with other, where trade balances matter. Um, and so the economy of the different countries of the world is completely intertwined. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Okay, so uh, a challenge there that you've, you've highlighted and, and picked up on as well. And we have another question there. I'm tempted to turn some of these questions back to you, actually, because I'm quite interested know some of your views on this too, so you're asking the questions. I mean, it, it's, it is a fact of life that the economies of, of different groups are intertwined. So what does that, you know, if you were the policy maker, what would you do is the question I would have. I'm not going to force you to answer it. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I just want to put each of you in the position of thinking it through and imagining yeah. you were the policy maker. What would you do? Yeah, well, we're, we're welcome to take comments as well as questions, so if, if yeah. feel free. But our, our next question, I think, is from the, the back. You indicated very clearly the scale of the problem and the time scale of the problem, which in terms of our individual lives is quite long, and that's part of yeah. the issue, I guess that each of us uh, and governments are often so focused on short-term problems for very understandable reasons. Absolutely. So for a personal point of view, I may need to diet, but I'll do it next week. Uh, for governments, uh, there's an election coming up, and at the international level, developing countries perfectly understandably want to develop. So where do you see the drive, the policy drivers coming from which would counteract those short-term pressures? Well, I, I mean, the short answer is, firstly, I agree with all your diagnoses. I mean, they're absolutely correct. Um, I mean, ultimately, the, the policy pressure has got to come from people who look at the scientific evidence and recognize the direction of travel. And I think our job is to communicate it clearly, uh, not hysterically, but clearly <coughs> and accurately, recognizing the fact that there are uncertainties, and just to hope that the policy makers collectively take this seriously together. Because if everyone works together, then the problem becomes a bit more easy if there was a carbon price, for example then it, it, it does become a bit easier on a global basis. But you need the whole world to agree, and that's why there is a UN process around this. Um, and it's not that we are the only country that takes it seriously. Many countries take it very seriously. China takes it very seriously. It's putting an enormous amount of research into alternative energy sources. So many countries are working about it and thinking about it. Okay, uh, we have another question around this side. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is John Redshaw. I happen to work for SIBA during the day. I'm a member of a local church and we are involved with Eco Congregation. We do recognise that this issue is more than an environmental one, more than a social one, more than an economic one. It is a moral one. I was particularly encouraged to see that that app is available in Mandarin. And I really want to probe the area I very much welcome the fact that you're coming out and speaking to people such as ourselves. That scientists need to do that more often. Yes, I agree. In fact, scientists are often not very good communicators with the public. Rather, we would really see a different breed who are able to connect with the public and with society. And I would really like to sort of put the question to you. On the one hand, how is attitude in China and India changing? with respect to climate change and its consequences and sustainability. And secondly, following on from that, to what extent is the UK government investing in social science research to connect better with society, to inform attitude and behaviour and sustainability? Okay, well, there's three questions there. Um, firstly, just to defend my tribe of scientists, I'm not sure that we're any worse than communicating than historians or uh, a a any other group. So I, some, of, some scientists are good at some aren't. Uh, just as in any cohort, there are some people that are good at it and some aren't. So, um, but I think that it's something that people can learn as well, actually. People improve communication is something that can be educated, actually. Um, so yes, it's important that scientists get out there, but it's, as I say, there is nothing uniquely bad about scientists as communicators. Um, on the second question, which is about um, 
attitudes in other countries. A personal anecdote is that in my last job as director of the Wellcome Trust, we um, uh, partnered with the Institute of Ideas in a debating matter competition, and that went to India. And I saw debates and discussions around climate change with young Indians. And I can tell you that that generation was extremely concerned about climate change. And I think there is an important generational issue here as well, because uh, whilst 2100 is extremely remote for all of us, it's slightly less remote to youngsters that are being born at the moment. Um, so I think there is a generational thing. Um, with respect to your third question, which is about the social science, uh, the answer is there is a considerable investment in social science. And of course, there needs to be a pull as well as a push. As a research funder, there needs to be people that are competent to spend the money wisely. Uh, but yes, there's some good social science going on, and social science is very good in tackling all of these problems. We need to understand people's values. Um, there are uh, all sorts of issues, which is, I take the risk, you get the benefit. There's discussions like that. So the social science, I agree with you, is extremely important, uh, but the money is available for people to do the social science research. Okay, thank you for that question and all those uh, points. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. I see a hand in the middle here. Before I collapse on exhaustion, <laughs> I, I, I started the day with the day programme on something quite different. We <laughs> have several heard you actually in the audience, I think. Um, this is our, our last question, I think, for we, we have Save the best for last. <laughs> no. No, you setting it up nicely for yeah. us. Well, no, you said, you said, uh, somebody said earlier that, that you know, we're preaching to the converted here, so I am the lone sceptic. Okay. Um, um, Welcome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, thank you for coming up here um, to talk to us. Um, my name is Andrew Montford. Um, I'm a writer. I write a little blog called Bishop's Hill. That's the one. Um, so I was going to come back to the point that the gentleman <laughs> over there raised earlier about um, uh, Matt Ridley's suggestion yes. that, that um, we were going to have that, that global warming was going to be a net benefit for, for the next 50 or 60 years. I think he was saying globally. I mean, that's yeah. the point he was making was based on Ricard Toll's paper, yes. which, which is a meta-analysis of all the economic studies and shows that it's going to be beneficial for the next two degrees or something. Okay. Now, the IPCC's draft Working Group 2 report, which has been leaked, shows that they are going to confirm that. Now, that being the case, do you regret saying that Matt Ridley was, um, was uh, irrational um, for suggesting that? Because clearly the uh, consensus is on his side rather than yours. Um, so I've read the top paper, and actually if you read the introduction to the top paper, he firstly says that climate change is the mother of all externalities. Mm -hmm. He talks about all of the uncertainties and the fact that the economic models don't take into account many of the potential impacts. Um, economics is not a physical science. It depends on some judgments about how humans discount the future. And therefore, the discount rate is extremely important. And there isn't actually a biblically correct answer to discount rate. And so you get a very different answer if you do the discount rate through the lens of a 0% discount rate to a 2 or 3% discount rate. Um, the economics also depends on predictions of economic growth. And part of that is based on the fact that if you do compound interest on 2% per annum, you get very large numbers indeed. And so I'm afraid the economic science is not as reliable as the physical science. Okay, but the evidence is on his side, isn't it? <coughs> it's not, I don't think, um, uh, the question I'm getting at is, is aren't you being uh, a bit harsh to say he's irrational? Well, that, wasn't, that wasn't what I said, and you've, you can read the transcript. So, well, I quoted, you have I quoted the quoted transcript on my, on my yeah. blog. You said you weren't sure whether he was rational. I was not saying I, whether it was rational to be optimistic. It's, an, it's a, a subtle distinction. <laughs> <laughs> but, a, but a distinction I make. <laughs> okay, but... Can I ask a question? Well, um, I'm certainly uh, drawing the questions to Sir Mark to an end, but um, I, think, I, don't think, I, don't think, I don't think he should be treated differently from any members of the audience. But um, I'm sure so, you I'm, glad you're, I'm, I'm very glad you're here, and I'm very glad you've asked the question, um, and I'm very happy to engage in the debate. Well, well good, because I mean, there was a lot of questions I kind of wanted. 
to ask you. I mean, one of the ones, I mean, one of, one of the best things, of course, I mean, what, do you want to, what do you want to take? Um, one of the things I was really pleased you did say was that you did want to engage in the conversation, because I know there is a lot of pressure being put on the media now to stop people like myself from appearing. Um, now, I wonder why. <laughs> well, yeah, I want to tell me why. Hang on, hang on, hang on, be fair, be fair. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy for everyone I mean, to express a view. Yeah, you know, I mean, I did, a, I did an interview um, on Radio 5 Live um, about a month ago, and I was up against a climate scientist. Yeah. And actually, we had a really good conversation, and I think yeah. it was the most informative conversation about the technicalities of climate models that there's ever been on the BBC. We didn't agree on very much at all, but yeah. I tell you, the public learned a lot. They learned, for example, that climate scientists don't think that models capture clouds very well. That's not common knowledge in the public. <coughs> clouds are the most important feedback in climate models. Now, what you get if you put Julia Slingo up on, on, the, on the media, she says, oh, the, the, the models are based on physics. They've got physics in, therefore they're right. And you know, this is drivel, and that is the kind of thing where scientists like you get accused of misleading. But now, I think you have to come clean and say, look, we head. can't do clouds, right? So, okay, but, but I, I, I mean, I don't think, I, I think in, in the interest of everyone, we should probably not continue this in front of everyone. But, but the question, I, I Why? They I, need to know. Hang on, the question I'd ask you is, what of my presentation this evening did you object to? Dolly, I've got, I mean, I've got months of material from my well, blog. Use, use it in your blog. <laughs> well, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure you will. Know, yes, and we'll okay. continue. We will continue this discussion um, outside of the lecture theatre because I'm just keeping half an hour on time. And some people do have to go. But thank you for for raising those points towards the end and giving us um, uh, some more food for thought. And um, and I I remember being in in many a Met office. Uh, discussion forum where clouds were discussed and, uh, and, and, and the media picked up on it at the time. But we can talk about that later. Um, what but I mean, let me just say, you are, you are right that there are uncertainties about clouds. But, 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 but what do you think the consequences would be if there was an enormous increase in the amount of clouds over the Earth? Don't you think that might be associated with some changes in, 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 in the climate? Well, yes, but of course, the economy is reducing the yeah? At a price. At a price. Okay. I think, um, once again, thank you for those points. Um, what, what I'd like to do now is just to invite Scotland's uh, Chief Scientific Advisor to say a, a few words in conclusion and a, and a few words of thanks, I, I believe, as well. So I'll, I'll give uh, Professor Muffy Calder the floor just to say a, a few concluding remarks. Muffy. Thank you very much. I will try to be very brief because I'm standing between um, you and some drinks outside. Um, but it is my job to thank the speaker, the chair and the audience for really a, a very a, an excellent presentation and some very, very interesting questioning. Now, I'm afraid since I happen to have the floor at the moment, it's, I think it's also my prerogative to add my own subject's dimension on this because most other people have put in a little bit about their own area. I'm a computer scientist, and I thought it was worth saying that um, in 1948, I believe there were five computers in the UK, and since then, we have reduced the energy consumption per instruction by one billion fold, which I'm told is the equivalent of being able to run the entire fleet of cars and lorries in the UK on two litres of uh, petrol. However, are we using less energy for our computers? Uh, no, we're not, because of course now we have 11 billion devices in our pockets, uh, which is growing exponentially. So what I'm trying to indicate is that of course uh, it's very complex because our engineered world is very complex and we are very reliant on, on it and now. But just to come back to Sir Mark's points tonight, he laid down three challenges which were about the scientific evidence of what is actually happening out there, which is sometimes uh, incomplete. The communication of that uh, science, which is actually what we've been participating in tonight. And the formation of policy, which is, of course, a very difficult task, and that's what is up to our democratically elected uh, politicians. 
And I think we dwelled on that in, in the questioning tonight very much. And as he outlined, what can we do? We can mitigate, we can adapt, or we can suffer. Um, hopefully we do uh, not so much of the last and a little more of the first two. But in each case, we do it by looking through multiple lenses about, about what we do. Um, we can look at the demand side, we can look at the supply side. Whatever we do, we have to be aware that we're very dependent on fossil fuels right now in our economy and in our um, society. And there is no one single technology, one single grand project that's going to solve it. it it's, a, it's a collective response, but individuals can make a difference. And I don't know if you were identified very much with the last slides he put up. I picked up a number of things that I was doing. And um, I'm sad to say I came here by taxi tonight, but I'm wearing a vest. <laughs> <coughs> and, on, and on that happy note, I would like to say to Sir Mark, thank you very much. I know you've had a long day. Thank you for such a provocative talk, and I hope you're wearing a vest too. <laughs> Perfect summary there, uh, Muffy. And now there are refreshments waiting outside the door on floor one and um, on behalf of the Science Centre. Thank you very much for coming this evening and for asking so many questions. But obviously, a, a huge thanks to, uh, to Sir Mark for taking the time to include Glasgow in your tour. And we'll be outside uh, to continue discussions, heated and otherwise, if you want to make your way towards the back of the Lecture Theatre. Thanks.